Good afternoon. Today is April the 3rd, 2016, and my name is Jessica Taylor, and I am in the Senior Physiologist Lounge at the Experimental Biology Meeting. Here we are representing the American Physiological Society, and today I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing Dr. Johnny Porter for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Porter has been a member of APS since 1978. He has been affiliated with the Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center at New Orleans and the William Carey University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Porter's research has focused on the investigation of the regulation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis and the abnormal regulation of the neuroendocrine axis in obesity and food intake. Dr. Porter. Dr. Johnny, Taylor. <laughs> welcome to the Living History Project. Thank you, thank you. You for are this welcome. Opportunity. So, if you're ready, I'd like to ask you some questions. Go for it. All right. So, based on some of the things that you discussed in your narrative, we're going to go through some questions. The first one is that you'll be able to talk to us a little bit about your history and your career as a physiologist, and also some personal aspects as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you grew up in an economically deprived parish in northern Louisiana. Can you tell me how it was in your family and your upbringing? Well, it was, it was actually a wonderful upbringing, but we were a very poor family. My father, uh, John, was a, was a farmer, and uh, he had a high school education. And my mother, Betty, she was, uh, you know, she shared in the work around the uh, place and helped with the crops and things. And uh, my sister, Sharon, and I grew up in that environment until I was seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. we, uh, my father built our house. It was, it was a little bit rickety. It was right <laughs> across the uh, road from my grandmother and grandfather's house, and I included in the narrative an actual picture of that place because my sister and Sharon and I still own that land up in North Louisiana, part of that land. Some of it went to other cousins. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it was a very loving type of relationship. My aunt Alma and Uncle Stone live right down the road. My grandmother and grandfather, Ed and Emma, live right across the road. And my sister and I would go over there and play and, and, and get into whatever we could get into, you know. <laughs> yes, and <sir. laughs> uh, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was really a, a great time because I was surrounded by cousins mm -hmm. and uh, a very loving family. We didn't even know we were poor. I mean, we were poor economically, but uh, we had a very active community at our small church there in that community mm -hmm. in uh, Shiloh. And uh, some of my relatives, uh, including my great, great, great grandmother, are still buried. Well, of course, she's still buried there. She, <laughs> she lived to be over 100 years old. She oh, traveled man. over from Georgia mm -hmm. uh, with her son, Tillman. Uh, I don't know, it's around 1847, that's when they settled in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was actually originally from South Carolina. Her name was Sarah. So it's kind of interesting. I always like to point to Sarah. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so it was a great time in mm -hmm. my life. Let's see, in 1958, you and the family moved to, wet to Kentucky, to Western Kentucky, mm -hmm. and you went to high school there. Mm -hmm. And after graduation, you went to Western Kentucky University. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your education there and about the individuals that encourage your interest in science and physiology? Yeah, uh, yeah. and let me, let me backtrack a little bit. I, I, before attending Western Kentucky, I went to a, a, a very fine uh, public high school mm -hmm. there around Owensboro, it's in Davis County, Kentucky. Uh, you know, it was called Davis County High School. And uh, I had a very fine education there. and the, the teachers were just excellent. I struggled a little bit in mathematics uh, coming from Louisiana where I didn't quite have maybe as good a math teacher as they had up in Kentucky. But my father was good enough to get me a tutor at, his, at, at Texas Gas where he, he worked. This guy was a petroleum engineer and he helped me uh, and brought me up to speed in algebra. So I, I progressed okay. then. And then, then, you know, I went on down to Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I graduated from high school in 1962. So I started at Western Kentucky in the fall of, of 1962. Right. And, uh, while I was there, I think I had two very wonderful teachers uh, there. One, uh, one's name was Don Bailey, mm -hmm. and uh, 
Don took a special interest in me. He saw something in me. I don't, I don't know what, because I was just a country boy, a country bumpkin, uh, but he was my physiology teacher. Mm -hmm. I think we used the very first edition of the Guyton textbook. Wow. And oh, I just love that textbook. I love to read it because Dr. Guyton was probably one of the finest physiologists that we've ever had in this mm -hmm. country, outside of maybe, you know, uh, uh, the Frenchman, uh, Claude Bernard and, and Walter Cannon <laughs> <Yes>. in our <laughs> country. So, so, so anyway, uh, uh, Don was a, you know, utilized me as a, uh, after I'd had physiology as his student grader. Mm -hmm. And then another gentleman there that, uh, that really influenced my life a lot was William Norris. And he taught me uh, comparative anatomy, a very rigorous course, and embryology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just learned a a lot from William Norris. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is, when I graduated from Western Kentucky, uh, that was in 1966, uh, Bill had, had left to go down to uh, Monroe. That was his home. Yes. And uh, because he wanted to be closer to his home and so I think his elderly parents. Mm -hmm. And he took a position at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. That's what it's known as now. Back then it was called Northeast Louisiana University. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I decided to go down there and take a look because I'd applied to Louisville, Kentucky. And they said, yeah, come on up. Uh, you could be in our graduate program. Uh, they did not offer me at the time a graduate stipend, so I, I, I drove down and I talked with Bill about this because I knew that ULM was starting up a, a new uh, master's program in biology. Ooh. And so uh, I went down and talked to him and uh, he remembered me, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, so they paid me. $2,400 to go to school. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Twenty-four. That was back in 1966. That you know, was a that lot was of money. a lot of money then. <laughs> and I said, I can't believe this. I told my mother and father, I said, I can't believe it. They're going to pay me to go to school. <laughs> and so I went down. And I still have aunts and uncles that, mm -hmm. that were, you know, still living in Louisiana. My Uncle Ernest and, mm -hmm. and Aunt Vera, they lived at the old home place. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather at that time were, were still living there. They were not too far from going into a nursing home at that time. Okay. And uh, so they were getting older and all of my cousins still lived there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, uh, so that was, uh, you know, how I got down to, uh, to ULM mm -hmm. and, and, and Monroe and uh, followed those two teachers. Okay. Yeah, so. Now, you must have made an impact at Western Kentucky because a few years ago they invited you back, didn't they? They did. <laughs> you know, 44 years post-baccalaureate, uh, they noticed that, hey, Dr. Porter, one of their graduates, had, had gotten out and, and had done a few things and <laughs> had become a physiologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they gave me the opportunity to come back and give the, a very distinguished uh, lecture at the university. And uh, I actually paid me for it too. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and that was nice. So, <laughs> but it was nice to be recognized by your mm -hmm. by your university. Uh, the fact is, uh, I got a notice in the mail the other day that uh, my graduating class at Western Kentucky is going to be ce celebrating their 50th uh, reunion. Wow! Yeah. Oh my goodness! All right. So you went to ULM as we know it now, ULM. and you got your your master's degree, and right. then you went on to, to LSU right. at the medical school in New Orleans. Right. And so how did this experience really shape your research career and, it's in, and your interest in well, it? Well, okay, let me, let me just backtrack a little bit on that too. So when I finished at ULM, I did a project. I was, I was always interested in, in monomines for some reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, my project back at ULM was uh, with an animal colony of, of hamsters. And I learned under Dr. Norris to do uh, a model of pseudo-pregnancy. Okay. Hamster's gestation period was like 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, did uh, a hysterectomy on them and then followed their vag the vaginal spheres after mating them with a vasectomized male, the mm -hmm. one that couldn't deliver gametes, then you right. could induce pseudo-pregnancy, which was exactly half of the total gestation period. Wow. So, uh, what we did was, as we studied 
uh, things like uh, lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, we you couldn't do this today. You couldn't get it probably by an IECUC committee. <laughs> Uh, we did blinded hamsters. Oh, okay. uh, it sounds pretty severe, but I mean, uh, we did uh, hamsters treated with a pineal endo called melatonin. Mm -hmm. And what we're, the object of that study was to try to see if we could shorten uh, the pseudo pregnancy as, as our, our reproductive model because uh, there was a lot of evidence at the time that those pineal endos were having an influence on the reproductive tract. Okay. So after finishing my degree at ULM, mm -hmm. Well then, uh, I, uh, you know, went to the Louisiana Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. uh, to give a talk on my master's thesis. And at that time, Dr. Raymond Russell, who was the graduate coordinator at LSU Health Sciences Center, then it was LSU Medical Center. Yes. Uh, it, the, the graduate school had just developed from the Baton Rouge campus there. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, we were still under the auspices of, of Baton Rouge and many things like SACS and all of this uh, sure. sort of thing for accreditation for the graduate school. So Ray heard me uh, give my talk mm -hmm. and uh, he in invited me to come down for, uh, uh, you know, to be a graduate student at, uh, at LSU Medical School. Mm -hmm. And they paid me again, Jessica. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I like this track so, record, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So that was that was nice for a country boy, and uh, so there I, uh, you know, I, I proceeded to start to work on my on my PhD. Mm -hmm. and, and now, you, now let me backtrack just a little okay. bit because I need to remember one important thing somebody, that happened in Monroe. Somebody that you met. Somebody that I met, <laughs> and uh, that's Miss Terry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's my sweet wife. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, we love Terry. 48 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and if I remember correctly, you were a starving graduate student. Yes. And she yeah. made you a cake. She did. And you sat on it. I sat on it. <laughs> she put it in the driver. I don't know why she put it in the driver's seat, but she did. She put it in the driver's seat. And, you know, I just got gotten through late at night mm -hmm. working on my hamster colony and, and making vaginal smears and all this sort of thing. <laughs> And, and, and I didn't see the cake and I sat on it. So Miss <laughs> Terry found a new way to, to approach and get into my life. There you <laughs> go, there you go. So you and Miss Terry moved to New Orleans. We did. Okay. We did, we moved to New Orleans. Uh, the summer before I moved to New Orleans, just to remind me that I needed an education. Miss Terry and I got married, mm -hmm. you know, in the summertime and I also worked a job uh, my father always made sure that I had a job during mm -hmm. the summertime, and uh, I always worked pipeline. Oh, okay. So I did manual labor while I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And the last summer, when Miss Terry and I got married in Osgood, Indiana, uh, uh, I worked for Houston Construction Company. We were going through Indiana, uh, putting down a 36-inch pipeline. Uh, throughout the rural area of right. Indiana, and that that was that was quite quite a push towards getting my PhD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No Reminding more manual me labor. That I didn't want to do this the rest of my life. No sir. No <laughs> Good sir. money though at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. so. so while you were in New Orleans working on your PhD, there were some very important people there. One was your mentor, Mary yes. Coyne. Yeah. And then there was also Andrew Shelley. Right. And Ava Caston. Right. And A. K. Aramura. Aramura. Bill, William Blacker too. And William Blacker. He was in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, endocrinology. And now Shelfie was a Nobel laureate, so that he, must have been pretty impressive. He was, and, mm -hmm. and you know, actually, uh, so w when I started off, uh, you know, Sidney Harris was a very internationally and nationally renowned cardiovascular physiologist. He was chair of the department whenever mm -hmm. I was a graduate student there. We had a lot of older faculty members. Uh, they were all very good teachers. Uh, Leon Cherney, uh, Toth, uh, and then we had some younger faculty, Howard Randall, Bill Palmer, Mary Cohen, yes. my, my uh, uh, you know, graduate advisor. And in mm -hmm. biochemistry, we had Paul Hyde, who had received uh, and, and, and studied with the St. Louis group, was a very famous steroid chemistry group. Okay. And so, so that was at LSU. And then Mary, when she came there, she, she worked, uh, she got her PhD with Dr. Julian Cate, 
uh, from Harvard. He was at the University of Virginia. He was an MD. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what brought my interest to Mary was is that uh, Kite was one of the guys that I had really read a lot of literature on when I was uh, involved with pineal gland studies. Right. He did a pineal gland study as a student at Harvard University and, and was invited to give talks all over the all over the world. Wow. And uh, so Mary uh, was so good to take me into her lab mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know we studied every aspect of the pituitary adrenal system that you can imagine Jessica. We we would make extracts of crude hypothalamus with corticotropin releasing hormone in it, crude stuff, mm -hmm. and then we had pituitary, hemipituitary incubations that we, that we would work on and stimulate with that crude CRH. Right. And then we would assay it finally in, in mm -hmm. adrenal pieces. You'd have a very special way that you put those pieces out in plates. Right. And uh, then the end point was to measure corticosterone. Uh, uh, you know, by fluorescent techniques. Right. And I'd be sitting there shaking these tubes. I, I got to where I could shake uh, maybe 10 tubes in one hand all at one time. <laughs> That's and not a skill everybody so, has. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, we, I was doing this sort of study with Mary, and mm -hmm. then Mary was collaborating with, with AKR Mira. He is a very famous endocrinologist, a neuroendocrinologist. He's dead now. He passed on. Mm -hmm. And then, so when Sydney was getting ready to retire, okay, mm -hmm. uh, I was just about, uh, well, well, let me finish this up. Okay. So Mary, Mary collaborated with Caston, uh, uh, and she collaborated some with Shally, mm -hmm. and she collaborated uh, with William Blackard. Okay, okay. and y'all weren't working on hamsters, is that right? No, we were working on rats. Oh, rats. It was all okay. white, all white rat work. And so that's how the uh, collaboration kind of started, Caston as well, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the VA group. Right. Okay. So then uh, about one year then, you know, to continue with my PhD work and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before I got my PhD, uh, Dr. Coyne, um, her husband, John, was a, 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 a surgeon resident over at Charity Hospital. Okay. And he had been there for, I guess, five years. Mary was there for about five years. We had NIH funding and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were from Boston. So one year before I finished my PhD, Mary said, look, I, we have, John wants to go back to Boston. He has a job. And so she went back to Boston. She left the NIH grant with me. I just, I was a senior graduate student. She right. left Dr. Hyde to kind of look over me and guide sure. me. And then I could correspond with her all I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that time, uh, you know, I, uh, about a year later, I finished up my PhD and Mary flew back down for my defense and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So during this, so that was 1973. Now, if I back up from that a little bit, mm -hmm. okay, or right after that, uh, but a back up to maybe 68 or 69 mm -hmm. uh, and 71, 70, 71 in that area. Right. This is the period that Andrew Shalley was working on uh, isolating the releasing hormones. He and Roger <laughs> Guillemon at the Salk Institute were going, I mean, they were at each other's throat all the time in a race to see who would be the first to isolate the first uh, releasing hormone. This had been shown to exist by mm -hmm. the fine work of uh, neuroanatomists in England called Geoffrey Harris. Okay. It's shown that there was no doubt that the hypothalamus had an influence on the pituitary gland. Right. So this is what they were after was to wow. demonstrate that these products existed and isolate them biochemically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, it was about, uh, you know, after I got my degree, you know, in 73, that uh, uh, Harris was getting ready to retire okay. from the Department of Physiology. And uh, he was, uh, you know, going to, we we'd interviewed a lot of people for chair. Yes. Uh, and, and we settled in on uh, John Spitzer from Hahnemann uh, Medical School mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And Dr. Spitzer was so kind to, under Sydney's suggestion, since Mary had left and gone back to Boston, mm -hmm. to offer me as a job as an instructor. I think in the narrative it said assist, or the questions it said assistant professor, I was an instructor. 
this means that you're like a postdoc, that the tenure count clock's not counting on you. Right. And so he gave me that time, John did, mm -hmm. and allowed me to, uh, you know, proceed with uh, teaching nursing physiology, which I'd been doing as a graduate student. Right. I was the course director as an instructor for nursing physiology. That was one of the first jobs I had. Now, so when he got there and he brought a lot of other people into the department, mm -hmm. uh, John, John Spitzer is one of the finest physiologists I think I've ever known, a great mentor for, for young faculty. Mm -hmm. He gave me time off to go over and study with Abba Caston. And Abba, of course, was working with A.K. Aramura and Andrew Shalley. Right. And Andrew would walk through the lab every day when I was over there with two graduate students working mm -hmm. with a frog skin bioassay in Caston's lab. Uh -huh. Well, eventually, I did my own project with Caston. We got a publication that's in my uh, curriculum vitae. Mm -hmm. But it was nice because Dr. Shalley had just won the Nobel Prize with <laughs> Rod, Rosalind Yalo, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Guillemot. Yes. Um, there was another physiologist over in Texas that was that I knew very well. After that, he was very sad that he didn't wasn't made a part of that. Oh, Sam wow. McCann, he's he's mm -hmm. deceased now, and I I had long talks with him after that, and I really thought he should have been a part of that group. But you know, they were honoring biochemists, and in the case of Rosalind Yalla, it was the case for uh, developing radioaminoassay. So yes. that's how my interaction with Dr. Shalley went. And of course, we invited him over to LSU to, mm -hmm. to give, after he won the Nobel Prize, to give a, a talk to our medical students sure. and, and graduate students. And it was really, that was a very exciting time in New Orleans. Man, we had a Mo Nobel Prize winner right, right under our, and I got to interact a little bit <laughs> with him, you know? So that was fun. Yes, yeah. sir. You've known some pretty, uh, some pretty well-known endocrinologists mm -hmm. and endophysiologists mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. Are there any others that you'd like to tell us well, about? Well, Bill, Bill Blackard, I'd like to mention him because Bill was the, uh, uh, you know, he was the uh, 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 chief of endocrinology at LSU, mm -hmm. and he and I had a great relationship. He and Mary had a great relationship. But after Mary left, uh, Bill, uh, he knew that it, as a graduate student that I knew how to do uh, uh, this assay with adipose tissue, oh. and uh, so we did a uh, uh, work with him uh, mm -hmm. doing, I think it was oxygen uptake and, and stimulating it, and we had this very special technique that we could use and, and assay hormones, and we did this thing with Bill with uh, uh, insulin and oh. ventolamine. Uh, to show, you know, some of the mechanism of how that uh, transpired. And, and we published that paper with, with Bill Blacker. That's on my CV as well. And Bill was a very, very fine man and an a, a excellent, excellent uh, neuroendocrinologist in regulation of growth hormone release. So here's another neuroendocrinologist that was in my life at LSU and was close by. Right. Bill knew the control of growth hormone uh, back in those days. He did a lot of work with the sympathetic nervous system and mm -hmm. growth hormone control, and uh, he was just a great influence on, on my life as a young faculty member. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And, uh, now, your primary appointment was at LSU, as we know, but you right. were also an adjunct at Tulane, right? I was. Okay. I, was uh, I was. Now, that, that kind of came later in my in my life after, you know, I finally, after, after I got promoted to uh, assistant professor, mm -hmm. uh, then I went through a lot of graduate students. Right. Now, we'll talk about those, in a, those students in a moment. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I went, uh, you know, with, the, with those students. So we, now, what, what was the question? I'm, I'm forgetting now. I've got, I've got to rambling it's here. It's okay. You, you were an adjunct at Tulane, so yeah, Tulane. you worked with both Tulane and LSU, and, and they had, a, mm. obviously, a collaborative relationship. You're right. Okay. So, so, you know, this came a little bit later, and so uh, Gabby Navarre, after he became chair of physiology, Norman Kreisman was the course director over there. Mm-hmm. They first uh, asked me as a, a endocrine person because they had Miriam Walters there and she was very busy with her research. And so they asked me to come over and participate in their summer course. And I did okay. that for a number of years. 
and I taught, uh, you know, the summer physiology course at, at Tulane, and then that evolved eventually into teaching uh, in biomedical engineering uh, at the main campus, to, uh, Tulane, because oh, wow. they, they offered a physiology course to biomedical engineering students as a part of their biomedical engineering training. So I did that for, I mean, up until I retired from LSU, I did it every year. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, That's a lot. And, so, uh, but now before we talk more about teaching and, and some of your physiology uh -huh. contributions, we have to talk about three very important events that occurred started in graduate school and occurred across about 16 years. Mm -hmm. What were those? Well, that was, when I arrived at LSU, <laughs> it wasn't too long and Miss Terry was, we found out she was, she was with child. <laughs> and uh, while I was in graduate school, we had our first little sweet baby girl, Trisha, mm -hmm. who is now almost 50 years old. Can you believe that? No, sir. I you had her whenever I was 12. Exactly. That's you know? why. So, <laughs> so. You were a physiology prodigy yeah. and a really young and, dad. And, it all works. So, you know, the, so Trisha was born in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Then after I got out of school and uh, was, you know, a, a, in an assistant professor stage and, mm -hmm. and, and heavily involved with graduate students, then eight years later, Tr uh, Julie Michelle was born. That was my middle child. Mm -hmm. And then eight years later, at Miss Terry, I just couldn't keep her off of me. And eight <laughs> years later, uh, we had a, a sweet son, mm -hmm. and that's the, the boy, yes. John Campbell, and uh, who now lives in Paris, France. Mm -hmm. All of my children have done really well. Uh, Tricia is an accountant on the North Shore. She works for a company called Gills Bar. Mm -hmm. Julie Michelle is a middle child, a typical middle child. Yes, sir. But she is a very successful uh, epidemiologist in the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, she attended... Uh, uh, not LSU, but Tulane University. We won't and, hold it against uh, you. She, you know, <laughs> and USM. She attended mm -hmm. at, at USM at Hasburg. Trisha yes, was at Lafayette. John Campbell was at Hendricks College, mm -hmm. and uh, he now works as a research marketing associate in uh, in Paris, France. I guess he'll live there the rest of his life. So, yes, sir. So those were very important events in my life. Mm -hmm. Let me say that you know our church was a very important part of bringing those children up too. Yes, sir. Uh, whether you believe it or not, I'm crazy as I can be, but uh, I was <laughs> an active ordained deacon of Metairie Baptist Church for 21 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and, sir. And, and all of my children were raised up in that church. Yes, so, sir. So. Important. What do you think has been your most significant contribution to physiology? Uh, you know, I, there's no question in my mind is the, the association with the students. Uh, let me start with the graduate students. Okay. Okay, so going back to whenever I was an assistant professor, uh, the first student was uh, Dr. Mark Hyman. I'll call him Dr. Mark Hyman because uh, Mark uh, came to me. He was a student at UNO. Mm -hmm. He worked under an endocrine person. Uh, out at UNO who taught him a little endocrinology there and then he came to us and he worked uh, uh, very very hard uh, and got his degree uh, and then he went on to uh, to work with uh, Nir Ben Jonathan up at Indiana University and then mm -hmm. he came back actually to New Orleans and worked a little bit with one of Dr. Shally's protégés, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Coy and okay. uh, learned, you know, he did ass biologic assays uh, Mark did for David's uh, peptides. Mm -hmm. David developed somatostatin, all kinds of synthetic peptides. Oh, wow. That's what he did. And uh, Mark would assay those. And then after that, after he had worked with uh, David for a while, he got a, a position back in Indianapolis where he had been working on his postdoc mm -hmm. at uh, the Eli Lilly company. He just recently retired from there. My wife said, he retired before me, and she says, well, what happened to you? <laughs> you know, your graduate <laughs> students already retired. All right, then I have Bobby Norman, Okay. And, and that was in the early, uh, you know, the late 70s. Mm -hmm. Bobby uh, worked, did some work with the uh, pineal endos and their control on pituitary hormone release. Mm -hmm. And he's now a cardiovascular surgeon. Then in the 80s, uh, you know, I had three very fine graduates. Well, actually four, five. I did five right, PhD students in the 80s. Wow. The, the first one, David Rohn, mm -hmm. uh, he did a very fine job. And, and by then now, we had, our research had moved into putting the, 
hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in terms of obesity. Okay. Uh, so we had at the time, uh, Dr. Judy Stern from UC Davis in California had visited us and given a seminar. So had George Bray, who was eventually the director of the Pennington Center yes. uh, in obesity programs. And, mm -hmm. and Judith was so kind to give me some uh, startup Zucker rats. And that's where okay. the Zucker obese rat model started right then. That was in the, I guess, the early to mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a colleague in physiology, Dr. Art Hartman, who worked with me on a lot of those early projects. But David Rohn was the first student that worked on that model, did a very fine job. He got three or four papers out during his PhD. That's a lot. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good job. And uh, David eventually is uh, wound up now at East Tennessee uh, Pharmacy School where he is a dean. Okay. Uh, then we had uh, Doug White, mm -hmm. and Doug White also worked with obesity and, and pituitary adrenal. Yes, and uh, Doug got his PhD in the late 80s, and he wound up at uh, Auburn University where he was the head of the nutrition department. He finally came to his senses after he had done that for about, I guess, six or seven years and decided <laughs> he wanted to go back into research and be a faculty member. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then we have Bruce Wright. Bruce uh, did a very fine job. I think you have met him on the education committee. Teaching, but yeah. yes, sir. And he, he Bruce, uh, Bruce kind of was a rebel in a way. He didn't listen to mine and John's advice. And he, <laughs> he went off and did his own thing in teaching. And so he's wound up, he's teaching now in the... Uh, Caribbean medical schools at Ross University. Yes, sir. He, he taught for a while at the new osteopathic medical school in Dothan, Alabama. Okay. And uh, then he said, he told me, I'm just not making enough money there, Dr. Porter. He says, I'm, he called me Dr. Porter too. He says, I'm <laughs> going back to the Caribbean. So he <laughs> likes it down there and he likes Ross. Ross is a pretty good uh, Caribbean medical school. Yes, sir. So, so Bruce, and then the next one, Art had a student, Art Hartman, my colleague, who worked with me on the Zucker rat some. Mm -hmm. He worked with adipocytes. We did all kinds of things with adipocytes okay. in the Zucker rat. And uh, he, he worked mainly with lipoprotein lipase, which is, you know, as the gatekeeper for moving those heavy particles out of the plasma yes, into sir. the adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. And he had a student uh, from Bahrain, Fidel al Riyadh. And so when Art decided he was going to retire, I took over that student and uh, helped him finish up his PhD degree. Okay. I was doing assays and cholesterol that I never dreamed that I was ever going to do, helping <laughs> him, you know, get, get his work done. Yes, sir. And uh, then after that, uh, I had Bruce. Mm -hmm. Bruce did an excellent job. Bruce probably got some, something like eight, eight papers out of the lab. But then we had started collaborating with Dr. Frank Svek, who had mm -hmm. taken over for Dr. Blackard, uh, in as chief of endocrinology. So Frank and I had a yes. very long and fruitful collaboration over 20 years in obesity. Wow. And that's where you see all the papers in obesity with Frank Sebeck on mm -hmm. my CV. Uh, we had decided at the time uh, that we were going to study uh, and focus in on a, on a very well-known adrenal steroid, dehydroepiandrosterone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the model that we used was the obese rat. Now we did all kinds of studies. We, we looked at you know, how the DHEA affected uh, adipose tissue, how it affected behavior, how right. it affected food intake. We just used food intake as an assay for it. Yes. Because this steroid seems to be a steroid that's a neuroactive steroid. Now what I mean by that is, is that it's a steroid that the French workers, Ballou and others, has shown that it exists, the enzymatic sh machinery exists to produce that steroid in the brain. And okay. so we did some very, I thought some pretty good studies. We published uh, several of them in an American Journal of Physiology yes, uh, relating to this. And, uh, but not to go into any detail on it because that would be boring for everybody to listen <laughs> to all of that. So, but anyway, that was a very fruitful and, and successful time in my career. And Frank and I had a very nice collaboration, uh, you know, uh, up through the, the 90s and, mm -hmm. and even up into uh, early 2000, up to 2005. Uh, and and you, all, uh, you all know what happened in New Orleans in 2005. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about we, it? We, we had Katrina. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Katrina was really a, a, a game changer 
in my 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 family's life. Yes, we sir. we we had to stay in Monroe, Louisiana, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got back uh, and was allowed in, uh, it was under martial law. My house was flooded. Uh, we didn't have any place to go, so I quickly uh, rented a small trailer. Miss Terry and I lived in a 19-foot trailer and parked in the front driveway for several months Goodness. while we were working on the house. Mm -hmm. I drove four days a week because LSU had decided uh, to move the campus up to the Baton Rouge campus. They had a, they had a cruise ship. They had... Uh, three campuses. They had South campuses for dental uh, students. They had Pennington Center for medical students. And then they had a movie theater for nursing students. Goodness. I taught in all three areas. And uh, so the nurses, w w that was the most fun because you would go in the movie theater. I've never lectured in a movie theater no, before. Sir. And you'd put your PowerPoints up on the screen. And it didn't matter if you were finished lecturing or not. When you smelt the popcorn popping at 11.30, it was time to give the lecture up, and that was it. <laughs> so I did that. I did that, Jessica, for, uh, you know, I did that for, for four days a week, plus working on my house when I could. I got yes, my computer sir. up and running pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is, is that Frank and I had uh, our Zucker rats located at the dental school. Yes, sir. That animal care facility and that school was one of the last ones to be up and running. The MEB got up and that was up and running pretty quickly. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, but the dental school, so when I finally was allowed to go back in there, mm -hmm. uh, all of those rats were just about dead, yes, except sir. for a few. And guess who they were? Who? It was the obese, it was a few obese rats. We took them back down to the mm -hmm. animal care facility downtown and refed them and they pork right back up they again. They had reserves. They, they had reserves. Absolutely. And it was, that was awful. Yes, sir. And you know, because that was, that was LSU's plan. It wasn't a good one uh, to move the animals from the basement up to the sixth floor during a, a, a storm event. But yes, no sir. one ever dreamed that we were going to have Katrina. No, sir. You know, I mean, it was just an awful thing. Mm -hmm. So I continued to do that for about a year, working on my house, teaching, driving to Baton Rouge, back and forth. And at that time, we were so lucky because we had put in, we had put in a grant to the National Institutes of Health with DHEA and yes, this sir. model of premature labor. Okay. And it was kind of, it really, it really was unfocused. Mm -hmm. And so... We got triaged, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I'm not the first person to get triaged. No, you know? sir. Won't be and the so, last time. And so, and so what we did was is we, we took that grant and we repackaged it. Mm -hmm. We took the DHEA totally out of it. Okay. And, and submitted it to the National March of Dimes. And it was a good project because it was okay. looking at oral inflammation and how it could poten potentially affect premature labor. Uh, in an animal model. Yes, sir. And uh, it was a hard, it was a hard physiologic model. But but anyway, we did that, and uh, we were we were lucky. We were on one of only six grants that were funded nationally in the country. Wow. And so I did that work after Katrina. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I, at that time, I had uh, Dr. Muriel pa Muriel Palmgren, who was mm -hmm. a postdoctoral associate, and she was a very big part of that. Uh, you know, and helping us get that grant up and running. And, and, but I was the one that had to show them how to put ligatures. That was the standard and true method of causing an oral inflammation in rat. Can you imagine putting ligatures in a rat's mouth? No, sir. We anesthetized them, of course. Oh, yes, sir. But that was a very <laughs> difficult project. That was, that was hard. We had, to make, we had a little chair made mm -hmm. that we put the rats in. We'd, Hold, have this chair would hold their mouth open and we'd put these ligatures in there. It oh was enough that, that, that it actually caused bone loss to occur. Wow. And uh, so it was, it was kind of a fun project and, yes, and we did it. We kept working with our DHEA uh, on the side as well. Yes, sir. You know, and, 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 and neuroendocrine effects of it. Mm -hmm. So. Now in 2010, so about five years after Katrina, yes. you retired from LSU. I did. And became a professor emeritus. That's and right. And you made the two hour drive to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Yes. For the start of the budding new school 
uh, William Carey University College of Osteopathic I Medicine. I sure did. Which is where I met you. I <laughs> met you there. And we shared an office. Now, uh, let me back up just a little okay. bit. Uh, so, I had been after Patricia Molina. Mm-hmm. I stayed after her all the time. I just stay after her to even today. We know that's our fine president <laughs> yes, of APS. <laughs> and uh, you, Patricia, throw your hat in the ring for chair because at that time, uh, you know, Bill Chillian had left. He was our head, and yes, Bill sir. had left. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of our younger faculty members had left uh, with the Katrina episode. Sure. And uh, so, Patricia, we had several candidates, and she threw her hat in the ring, and, mm -hmm. and sure enough, she, uh, she was the one that, yes, that became the chair of physiology. And, and I looked at this, and, and I finished up my project for the March of Dimes, and, you know, at that point, I had 37 years of service in at LSU. Uh, of course, I went to Human Resources and counted my uh, pennies and said, <laughs> you know, how, am I going to really add anything <laughs> to this if I stay three more years? Yes, sir. And the answer from Human Resources was not, you're not, mm -hmm. uh, because I had gone into a deferred retirement option plan, which allowed me to build up an investment account. Okay. And you lose service for those years. Yes. So anyway, uh, a, a colleague uh, from LSU, mm -hmm. you know the crazy Teachy Sharpie, that wonderful man. Yes, sir. Uh, we all know and love, <laughs> had uh, moved up there and, and mm -hmm. he had taught with me some uh, at, on the dental campus and he, he got after me to, to consider coming up there. Well, Miss Terry and I had a lot of talks about this, but we finally decided, hey, this may not be a bad idea. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to drop back, not be involved in research, mm -hmm. and then focus on teaching physiology to medical students yes, at sir. the time. I had taught medical students and dental students and graduate students and nursing students mm -hmm. at LSU, but here I was just teaching medical students. I met you and I met Dr. John Bailey, mm -hmm. y'all were colleagues of mine, yes, sir. and I thought we had a real good physiology group up at Cary. Yeah. Now, I was made the, the chair of the uh, promotion and matriculation committee. Yes, sir. That was, a, that was kind of a challenging committee. You were on it, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, dealing with students uh, who's in grade trouble. Mm -hmm. and, but we did a good job, I think, and we mm -hmm. got it up and running because, uh, you know, and, and then we were on admissions. You were on admissions. Yes, sir. We had to do all kinds of committee work there because, I mean, there was no one to do it except mm -hmm. us. And there wasn't anything and, to begin with when and, we got there. Yeah, I, I felt like when we first got there, Jessica, that, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, it was like putting fires out. You know, that you remember that little pop-up game where you, you hit an animal and something else pops? Whack-a-mole. That's what I, <laughs> yeah, what is it called? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. I felt like we were doing <laughs> whack-a-mole all the time. Yes, sir. Yeah, but we finally overcame um, the bumps, and they, the bumps started to smooth out a little bit as we got into the fourth and fifth year mm -hmm. after many trials and tribulations. And yes, uh, we graduated our first class, right, at yes, year sir. four. Yes, and now, I, before and then, I retired, the second class, mm -hmm. and we're getting shortly ready to uh, graduate the third class. And we got full accreditation from COCA. Yes, sir. Uh, during yes, that sir. period, so I think that was that was a pretty fun and significant thing. And you know what, too. Dr. Taylor, I got the chance to meet that dynamic you, Dr. <laughs> Jessica Taylor. Well, thank you, Johnny Porter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to switch gears for just a minute, okay. and we're going to talk about APS and coming to meetings for just uh -huh. a minute. And can you tell me what your very first APS meeting was like and I how sure it's can. different from this meeting today? I sure can. <laughs> when I went to my first APS meeting, mm -hmm. it was at Atlantic City Whoa. on the boardwalk. So we would fly. Well, actually, <laughs> before Mary left, Mm -hmm. She took me to the endocrine meetings. It was okay. nothing but going. But after she left, I decided I'm going to be a physiologist, Mary. And so, <laughs> so I went to the endocrine. And, and so we went uh, to Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. And we would fly from New Orleans to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then we would get off the plane there and pick up a bus. And it was a three-hour bus ride from there over to Atlantic City. Goodness. And uh, so... I gave, you know, some of my early talks and early abstracts and poster presentations and, and whatnot at, at Atlantic City. Yes. You had to watch out when you were on the stage at Atlantic City because if you stop 
if you step back too far from mm -hmm. the podium, you would fall off of the stage. In fact, no. it actually happened to one of my colleagues, <laughs> Ted Shield. He just disappeared, <laughs> and he got up and started talking again. It didn't even didn't even phase him. Goodness you know? gracious! So that was that was a lot different than the modern meetings that we have now in San Diego, San Francisco, yes, and, uh, and, and and all that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Chicago, so, we used to go to Chicago. So. Next year? Yeah, next year, I mm -hmm. think we're going back, yeah. So, how has the APS played a role in your career? A, a big role, you know, I've, I've been able to, uh, not, not only has it given me a foundation and a place to go and to present my work, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, but it but it served as an opportunity for me to participate on some committees. Yes, sir. Um, I was on the committee on committees out of the endocr endocrine committee. Okay. I was the, the nominee from the endocrine committee. Mm -hmm. So I was on committee on committees, and uh, we got to uh, choose people to be on various committees in the society. Of course, representing in the endocrine uh, section, you know, it was my job to try to put as many endocrine people on there as I could. Sure. Uh, so I, that was my job. Now, the first year that I was on that committee, you were on, you had a three-year term. Mm -hmm. First year I was on that committee, I got slaughtered. Oh, no. Because, you know, the cardiovascular guys, they're more numerous. Yes. Sir. And uh, so they kind of would override mm -hmm. some of the smaller committees. Second year, I was loaded for bear. <laughs> And I got plenty of the endocrine section people on the committee. Good. And so that was that was fun. I mm -hmm. enjoyed that, and it gave me an opportunity. I'll never forget Dr. Molina at that time was a, I'm going to tell the story on her. Okay. Since she's our wonderful, lovely president. She was, she had this idea in her head that she, she wanted to be on the finance committee. Well, finance committee was something that we didn't even deal with yes, in sir. terms of nominations. That was chosen from very in people it was in so when i got out of the meeting she's did you nominate me to that finance committee you know how patricia can be did you nominate me to that fine i says patricia i couldn't do it i says chuck lang was there and he's my witness and he remembers <laughs> her, her writing me that i didn't get her on the finance mm -hmm. committee she wanted to be on the fine that was a funny thing that is funny of course now she's the president of the aps so yes, she sir. she she has arrived and mm -hmm. you know she knows all the finances of the of the physiology society right yes sir yes see what what else in terms of i also served uh, on the uh, another committee I served on it, with the physiology society it was I thought was a very very nice one was the uh, Porter Minority Committee especially since it was named after me not really <laughs> he was Porter. a very famous uh, Porter was a very famous uh, African-American physiology that started a company for uh, physiologic recording devices and he gave a lot of money to the physiology society and that committee I think has helped more minority physiologists than, you know, uh, we can imagine. Yes, you know, to get them involved and get them on a track uh, where they're coming to meetings, that they're meeting uh, senior people and they're giving their talks. Yes, and so this was a committee, uh, it was designed to help them financially, to provide them travel to the meeting and also mm -hmm. to provide them with some grant funding. Uh, you know, to do the projects because, you know, some of, some of those schools that they, the, the, some of our minority students were coming from, uh, you know, whether it be Hispanic, whether it be uh, African American, mm -hmm. or whether it be, uh, you know, American Indian mm -hmm. or Asians, uh, they, at the, at, you know, a lot of this time, they needed some help in some of the schools that we were uh, getting these students from. They yes. needed help to come to the meeting and be involved and get in touch with colleagues that could really see them progress through the ranks. Yes, and, and so that was, I thought that was an important committee and I enjoyed doing that. I, I jokingly uh, told the committee members, we, we had a meeting, like you, you went to Bethesda. Yes, sir. Right? And uh, so uh, I, I jokingly told them that based upon my background in North Louisiana mm -hmm. and my economic uh, deprivation. Yes, sir. That that I was probably more of a minority than some of them. It was a joke, <laughs> you know. It was not true. I had a wonderful life. Yes, sir. I was not deprived at all. Yes, sir. So I have just one last question okay. before we end today. All right. If you could give one piece of advice to students today on science, what would it be? I my best piece of advice to any student is number one, work hard. Mm -hmm. 
because you're not going to get any. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but overall, I guess I've had a decent career as an average physiologist. Yeah. I'm an average Joe. I've been involved in, in teaching and research and teaching graduate students and postdoctoral students, and, and mm -hmm. that's a wonderful thing. And uh, I would advise them to, to work hard, number one, mm -hmm. not ever to give up. Don't give up. Mm -hmm. Keep trying. And be a good human being. Yes, sir. Don't treat people shabbily. You know, I could go back down to LSU tomorrow, and, 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 guess, and guess what? They see me as a human being. Mm -hmm. you know, even the floor people mm -hmm. see me as a human being, you know? Yes, so sir. be a good person. I, that would be the advice that I would give. You can, you can, get, you can get more out of, of people by being a good person to it. Be stern. Sure. Give them direction, mm -hmm. but be a good human being. I would advise them all to be a good human being. I think sometimes in science that we get a little caught up in, I'm going to get there first, the politics mm -hmm. of science. This lab, I'm going to beat this lab here. Of course, we all know that funding is very competitive. Yes, and sir. there's probably a lot of cutthroat in our business. But be a good human being. That would be my advice. Be nice to people. Try to help people because we're really all in it, all in it together. And and you know, no no one's going to make a discovery. It's going to totally change the world uh, anyway. Sure. In, in our business, maybe the exception to that was Stephen Jobs <laughs> when he made the Apple computer and the iPhone, huh? And maybe so. I'm not I'm not sure that I'm all convinced that Bill Gates did us a favor with uh, all of those software programs that he developed. <laughs> okay, but. Uh, be a, I, I would advise him to be a good person, to mm -hmm. be a good human being, work hard, yes, work sir. hard, don't give up. I think that's good advice. I do too. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Johnny. You're welcome. Dr. <laughs> Taylor, it's been a pleasure it has been giving this fun. living interview with you asking the questions today. I felt totally at ease and able to tell my story. Well, good. Well, thank you for letting me do it. Okay. You're <laughs> welcome.